is it fair to say you you were kind of the good before google you were google for citizens like <laughs> requests and support right if you didn't know an answer to something you couldn't just google it before but you could go to citizens advice so i'd love to know because obviously a lot of our work as marketers is knowing what people google what do people ask or like most commonly what are the most common requests um, and has that changed over time i think it tends to reflect what's going on in the world at the time you know what's going on in wider society so for example um when there's been a recession you know we've seen increases in queries about debt um we see more people in poverty and like when we had the eu referendum there was a really clear correlation there that suddenly everyone's looking at uh, our brexit advice page or, or wanting to you know ha have, have inquiries around brexit so um yeah so it changes over time and i'd say that right now um, obviously because of the cost of living crisis as I'm sure you can imagine um, we're seeing more and more people come to us in a crisis situation which wasn't the norm I don't think we were necessarily seen as a crisis service you know it was more well, us if you've got advice you're struggling for money um, but certainly now we're seeing more people that have got a negative budget so they've got more money going out and coming in um facing eviction or you know can't afford the basics can't afford food um and of course energy problems at the moment is is huge And welcome to this episode of On the Same Landing Page. As always, um, I am Astra, Head of Advertising at Web Presence. I'm joined by my co-host Jason. Say hello, Jason. Hello. And this week we are lucky enough to be talking to Hayley Wright, who is the Communications and Engagement Manager at uh, Citizens Advice. So Hayley, welcome. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for coming on. Thank you. Hayley, can you give us an overview of Citizens Advice? I'm sure it's kind of um, a household name in many respects, and many people know it as this kind of like online resource, but the work that Citizens Advice do stretches far beyond that, doesn't it? So I know it's a big question, um, because <laughs> you have so many facets, but <laughs> can you discuss a little bit about um, an overview of what Citizens Advice does? Yeah, of course. I think a lot of people have a, a know a bit about it. Um, <laughs> But yeah, it is quite broad. So um, generally, we're here to sort of help people find a way forward. So whoever they are, whatever their problem. Uh, so we're made up of a network of, I think, 270-ish wow. local citizens advice officers um, across England and Wales. Mm -hmm. So we can help people with any issue, um, whether it's housing, money, benefits, employment, energy, consumer issues. Um, so really broad. Um, and we help as a network, we help, um, I think the most recent figure was 2.5 million people a year. Um, so really, really big impact. Um, I think the side that people know less about perhaps is the kind of policy side of the work that we do. So we don't just give advice to individuals. Um, we obviously see so many people, over 2.5 million people a year. Um, and that gives us a really unique insight into the kind of problems that people are facing right now and over time and how that changes. Um, so we can use that knowledge to campaign on um, big issues, whether it's local or national issues. So in one way, we're kind of helping everybody, not just the people that we directly um, support. Yeah, I was going to say, I didn't know until speaking with you that there was any sort of uh, policy in, involved in it. Um, but you touched on a little bit there. Obviously, you do speak to people. The face of the organisation has somewhat changed over the years, as with everything. Um, it's gone largely online. I remember, you know, being young and my mum going to the town hall to speak to citizens as advice. Whereas now, I think, fast forward 27 years, I had to speak to them a few weeks ago and had a video call online with someone. Um, so... Kind of, I guess my question is, I don't, not that I'm implying that you're old enough to know, <laughs> but what are the pros, no. pros, and, pros and cons of, um, you know, having the more in-person approach for the advice versus um, the digital side of things? Yeah, um, so I think it has changed a lot, um, mostly for, for the good, but I would say when the charity was founded, which was 
1939 so just after war was declared that was when citizens oh, wow. advice sort of started and it was obviously all face to face then helping people with like uh lost ration books homelessness you know finding uh family members and things like that so it was yeah. uh, you know and face to face has always been a huge part of the service i think it's what people think of us you know they're going into yeah. an office or into a library or something and speaking to somebody um and ignoring the the covid years where everything everything <laughs> yeah, changed and we had to immediately cease all face to face um we do offer face to face and we always have done but it's part of a suite of options for people mm -hmm. so um there's now it it's changes depending on the local office because we're all uh, sort of independent charities we all work slightly differently funded slightly differently um but certainly where i work which is um sort group so stockport oldham rochdale and trafford um we offer face to face advice but also um phone which is our most our sort of busiest service we have what's called an advice line um, and then we have like video advice, WhatsApp and loads of online self-help, which some people prefer to access. So I think at the moment, about 10 percent of everyone that we see um, visit us face to face, whether that's um, you know in a community location or one of our sort of bases. Um, so it's still quite a significant part of the service. Um, yeah, so I think I think the problem this is for everybody not everyone is going to want to pick up the phone not everyone is going to have the time or the inclination to sort of get a bus across to wherever come in and see somebody so we're able to help people you know outside of office hours and things like that whereas in the past that was I think a limitation of face-to-face -face. Mm -hmm. yeah how do you um at a local level um kind of get the name out further so how do you market citizens advice because I've seen your TikTok uh, at a general level like at the kind of central level is amazing you've got some really good marketing yeah. stuff there but I can imagine the budget is quite different to what and the uh, like the, the the ceiling on what you can do uh, at a central compared to a local level so what does that look like for you in terms of marketing citizens advice yeah I mean I think what's what's really good for a local for all of us local offices is that we're part of that network so we kind of benefit from um special support and the um the sort of bigger marketing the tiktok and stuff that the national um charity are able to do so we're able to tap into that and utilize content which is fantastic um but yeah certainly at local level and i think i can sort of speak of other local offices as well much of what we're doing is on is on a zero budget um or a very tiny budget so we have to kind of prioritize and focus our efforts um, and think about where we can uh, make the most impact so we have um the office i work for we have a um a comms and engagement strategy that we're kind of constantly tweaking because things change so quickly um but you know everything that we do needs to be sort of smart and focused and needs to kind of align with the wider organization's goals so for us and i'm sure this is the same for pretty much all citizens advice is that we want to help more people because demand is increasing and probably won't stop increasing. Yeah. And we also want to demonstrate our impact because we need to show um, the impact that we're having on society to be able to keep funding the services that we deliver, you know, and to kind of meet that continued demand. So, um, yeah, so I think it's just that we have to be very, we have to prioritise and kind of be focused on what we want to achieve. One of the things I'd say that we do, um, so certainly where I work, uh, we've got really diverse communities that we serve. So we want to make sure that we're reaching those communities. Um, so one of the things that we do really regularly is kind of look at our local data. So we, we capture loads of rich data every time somebody accesses our service, whether it's through the website, through the phone or whatever. So we've got all of this rich kind of background information that's anonymized of, of who's seeing us, what age they um what age are they? What kind of demographic are they? What ethnicity are they? Um, and in looking at that data and kind of digging around a bit, you can see where there's maybe gaps. So who who are we not seeing that we feel that we should be seeing based on the area that we work in, the communities that we serve? Um, so then we would focus quite a lot of our marketing efforts on reaching those communities. So that might, that could be something like paid advertising, like 
targeted advertising where we know we've got a specific goal um or it could be as simple as going to an event um that a partner organization are running or a community event where we know we're going to be able to kind of engage or reach a certain group um so yeah i think similar but just we have to constantly prioritize and and I think it's easy particularly when you, we're seeing what the national charity do what the national charities do and you think oh that looks good you know I'd love to do that mm-hmm. <laughs> but I think we can tap into things that have already been done sometimes we copy things the national citizen advice are doing and and use their insight and think okay we're going to try that or learn from what hasn't worked, you know, what other organisations are doing. Um, So, yeah, I think it's just constantly refocusing why we're doing what we're doing. Yeah, it's refreshing to hear you kind of like data led there. You look where the holes are in terms of who you're reaching and then focus on that. That's really good to hear. Um, It can be tempting just to go off of what's current and go go there and and, and do a campaign on this because other people are doing that. So that's good to to hear. Um, is it fair to say you you were kind of the good before Google, you were Google for citizens mm-hmm. like requests and support, right? If you didn't know an answer to something, you couldn't just Google it before, but you could go to citizens advice. So I'd love to know, because obviously a lot of our work as marketers is knowing what people Google. What do people ask or like most commonly? What are the most common requests? Um, and has that changed over time? Yeah, I think I think it does change. I think it tends to reflect what's going on in the world at the time, you know, what's going on in wider society. So, for example, um, when there's been a recession, you know, we've seen increases in queries about debt. Um, we've seen more people in poverty. And like when we had the EU referendum, there was a really clear correlation there that suddenly everyone's looking at uh, our Brexit advice page or, or wanting to, you know, ha- have inquiries around Brexit. So, um yeah so it changes over time and I'd say that right now um obviously because of the cost of living crisis as I'm sure you can imagine um we're seeing more and more people come to us in a crisis situation which wasn't the norm I don't think we were necessarily seen as a crisis service you know it was more if you've got advice you're struggling for money um but certainly now we're seeing more people that have got a negative budget so they've got more money going out and coming in um facing eviction or you know can't afford the basics can't afford food um and of course energy problems at the moment is is huge I think even when I started working for the charity which was about four years ago no one really talked about energy advice as being a thing it wasn't like you know was really something that was a big issue people have always had a problems with debt obviously in certain household bills but um obviously with the huge rise in, in energy mm-hmm. prices, um, that's kind of the most common debt issue that we're seeing at the moment. And because of that, we've had to set up um, like a dedicated energy team and a dedicated crisis team. Whereas, as I say, that's, that's all relatively recent, but it's the everyday issue that kind of comes up time and time again. Um, I think what's helpful as well, I know I mentioned before about kind of data and policy, um, but because of that data that we have, we are able to obviously there's certain things you can predict when you know that there's going to be a big policy change that's going to have a huge impact on on the people we support um but through the data we're often able to kind of spot trends as they're just starting to emerge and kind of identify the fact that this is a problem and this is probably going to get worse for this group of people so so we can kind of plan with some things you know where we might need to find additional um resource within the service we might need to kind of mobilize or we might need to do some kind of campaign work um but certainly i think the cost of living crisis you know is quite well the pandemic's probably an example as well where there's no there's no real way of predicting like um, and suddenly you know all the questions were around earlier we were thinking i don't i remember thinking i don't know what means. I was trying to stop. you know you're kind of learning as as other people are what's going on yeah, that's, so, yeah. Cool. That's, that's so interesting though I didn't consider that there would be so much data management and analysis involved and that your functions and the way you operate would be would need to react in real time to questions and queries so a number of queries in one area if that shoots up that changes how your department is then kind of 
you have to re, re resource your department to the act. Is that is that right then? Yeah, certainly. And I know. I mean, we have um, advisors that work at kind of different levels, and we've got specialist debt advisors, um, so people that are more or, or energy focused advisors. But within that, there is a lot of movement. So obviously, like with the pandemic. The face-to-face advisors weren't doing that anymore. Everyone kind of had to pivot. <laughs> um, or there'll be times where certain team members will take on additional training because they need to be kind of moved into to a different service or they need to start providing um, support like digitally, whereas they were used to, to working on the phone, that sort of thing. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I also find it interesting. I, I always thought as citizens' advice as a resource that you go to, but the fact that you try to get out to people who maybe aren't aware of it, is um, really interesting as well. I never considered that it was like a two-way thing, um, weirdly. So, yeah, yeah. So, uh, you kind of talked a little bit there on um, what the current searches are, if you like, and it's mostly around the cost of living. Is there anything outside of the cost of living? Because that doesn't seem to be dissipating at all in the future anytime soon. Um, but anything outside of that that's like a big upcoming focus for you guys, um, either at sort level or national level that you're aware of? Yeah, I think... I mean, as you say, I think there are things that we know won't go away and will continue Mm -hmm. to be an issue. Um, Like people will be struggling, I think, with debt for a long time. Um, But yeah, there's things that we're seeing through the data that we have. And this is kind of data that the national team and the local teams are doing. So we can kind of tap into all of that and see what's happening across the country. Mm-hmm. Um, but for example, people who are in a negative budget, that, that's a huge issue at the moment. And that's something I know I've mentioned before, but um, you know, we're seeing more people who typically wouldn't have struggled, <laughs> you know, in kind of quite well-paid jobs, to sort of two job families. Um, where actually there's no way to make the sums add up. Um, And and so their outgoings are just higher than than what's coming in. And I think that's something that we are concerned about um, because people are into certain things that they pay. Um, We know as well that, like, one thing we are concerned around is the increased energy costs, but particularly how that affects certain groups. So we know that it's affecting um, people who are disabled, so particularly people who might be relying on certain uh, medical equipment or things, mm-hmm. things like that. Um, and also people who are on prepayment meters and who are kind of stuck on those prepayment meters. Um, yeah. That's a huge issue. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a few things I think that we yeah. know is uh, kind of coming up, things that we are going around. I know one big area of research and work that's being done across the whole sort of policy side of citizens advice is around um, sort of energy efficiency, mm-hmm. because we know that energy prices may continue to fluctuate, but they're going to be high and we kind of have to get used to the fact that they're going to be high. So it's thinking, what can we do longer term to kind of reach net zero to improve energy efficiency in people's homes um yeah what can we do to kind of mitigate rather than just dealing with what's right in front of us how can we kind of look ahead and um you know solve some of the problems at the root I suppose yeah that makes sense I mean you kind of have a unique perspective as well I guess um as you did a little bit of work as a comms officer in the national uh, national level um and then have returned back to sort now you mentioned previously as well um that all of them, is it, was it two, over 207 or 70? Sorry if I've misquoted there. Individual. 270. 270 um, individual charities, and they're all kind of funded slightly differently. Uh, can you just touch on that a little bit? Uh, what that mean, what you mean by that? How it works? <laughs> yeah, so um, I think it is quite complicated. I think you could you could obviously speak to different local offices um, and they would be completely different. So, so where I work across four local boroughs we have a kind of um we get some funding so the national charity has certain funded services around um debt support so we're kind of funded to deliver debt support and then um certain local offices around the country will uh sort of paid or funded to deliver that support but then on top of that we're also really actively seeking pots of funding yeah. um, in, in increasingly creative ways, you know. So, so for example, uh, our energy team um, 
we're constantly sort of looking at how can we increase funding, how can we show the impact that we have and kind of show the impact that we can have in future if this funding is continued. But certainly we're facing the same issues that um, I think all charities are, are facing where funding um, is not consistent, you know, and, and um, even certain pots of money that have been quite secure over the past few years and you sort of plan that in, mm -hmm. um, you know, what's expected to come next year might be 50% less. So, um, yeah, so as a service, I think we have to be really mindful of how the money we have changes and how we can kind of future-proof charity because demand won't go down. So we have to kind of think, what if ways can we um, increase demand that doesn't, sorry, can we meet that increasing demand without just throwing money <laughs> you know, without yeah. bringing in more people yeah so that's the, the the eternal challenge I think I love that it's like yeah being more creative with it which just means like right okay so there's no more money <laughs> at this moment. we're gonna have to brainstorm <laughs> this again <laughs> yeah we uh, that, that sometimes, yeah. You, you do get some of the best sometimes the best work out of those like where we've got budgets that are, are, are smaller than we'd like we do have to get creative um, but there is like a limit on that. <laughs> there is a ceiling where you're just like, okay, yeah. Well, yeah, but we could really do a lot more with with a little bit more budget um, as a team, isn't there? Um, interesting though. And yeah, I, I, you know there's what? definitely things where. Sorry, go on. Oh, no, no. No, I was just going to say there's definitely things where, I mean, I I try and sort of be, I try and see the limits of the funding as a exciting challenge <laughs> rather than a, you know oh god wouldn't it be great if we had this that and the other um and I know like during um during the pandemic we were able to secure small pots of funding from our local councils we're talking sort of 500 pounds here or there um and and the briefs around that were to kind of reach certain audiences so it might be people who are particularly vulnerable in a certain way um and that, you know, that was quite fun because they would have these kind of quite strict um, targets that they wanted us to reach. And then obviously you've got this very small pot of money. Um, so it's kind of thinking, well, how much can we do with this? And sometimes, well, I think all the time you can do more than you, you think you can. So, yeah, it's, a, it's definitely creative. Also, yeah, and there's more, there are lots and lots of ways to, to, to achieve the same thing, especially in the digital space now, isn't there? Um, I'd love to, to know what your kind of day to day is is like, and because you've kind of done a bit of a stint at the national level and the local level, what is the role of a comms and marketing person like at the Citizens Advice? Yeah, so um, I suppose the diff the, the main difference is the remit, you know, that you would have. So. Um, like I say, at the moment, I'm at a local office, but working across four four offices. Um, we have um, a sort of 1.8 person comms team. So it's me and one other person. Um, and that's kind of covering anything that you could put the word comms in to. So um, it's anything kind of external, sort of profile raising, it's social media, anything to do with the website, um, anything to do with press, kind of media work. Um, it also includes the kind of local campaign side of things. So the research and campaign, so looking at our local data and sort of identifying those trends and, and thinking about what we want to do, <laughs> um, who we want to influence, who we want to speak to. Um, and also things like the internal comms as well, which is quite a big part of the role. So it's keeping um, all of our advisors who mostly are remote, we're all working either from home or out in the community. So we're very rarely all in one place. So that's quite a big part of the role as well, is thinking how can we all be connected and sort of support each other. Um, and it also includes things like internal events. So nationally, um, my my sort of stint at national was within the network comm side. So it was internal comms. So it was how the national charity engages with the local offices across the country. Um, so in that sense, it was much narrower you know so you're working with bigger numbers at the national charity because i think we're in the, the whole area of the, the, the country um 
but at national citizens advice there is a there's that network comms team which is like the in, internal comms I guess and then there's also like a brand and marketing team you know there's a news team there's a policy um team so there's specialists in those areas I think one of the things I found working for local office is that sometimes you can feel um that you like I don't want to put myself down here but where you kind of you can do a bit of everything but you're not a specialist in anything you know yeah. <laughs> um so I think sometimes that can be a bit challenging because you see what other people are doing and you think oh god I wish wish I could do that and then you have to kind of remember oh no that's like one person who's in a specific team just doing that one thing um but as I say I think you kind of get the best of both worlds with a charity like Citizens Advice because you're working locally um, and you, you're doing all the day-to-day -day stuff and kind of doing your best like we all are but you can also tap into the expertise at national so for example if I've got say if we've got a media request that um, for whatever reason feels a bit challenging or I'm not quite sure if it's something that we should be kind of picking up on or doing I could speak to the national press team and get that guidance and that kind of reassurance that, you know, just for somebody to say, yeah, we agree with you or no, or, or we'll take it, you know, we'll kind of, we'll kind of deal with it. Um, same with brand and marketing, you know, there might be things that uh, there might be ideas that we have as a service, but we don't have the resource to do it. So that could be like an idea that we might kind of pitch to the national team who might then pick it up across the country and it'll have more impact for that. In, in that way so um yes yeah, so I think you get the the best of both worlds really yeah it's, a, it's such a different experience isn't it like you are I, I found that so interesting when you said anything with the kind of comms can be attached to was part of that but that is that is almost all of business <laughs> except for <laughs> you obviously <laughs> then say well external stuff so it kind of doesn't just become everything your job but when you are local, when you are in a smaller team, you do just have to kind of do everything, don't you? And you you just figure it, you, you have some people to, to lean on, but at a national level, that's so different because, yeah, you have a remit that's very specific and you don't want to kind of stand on someone else's toes if that's their role. It's, just, it's such a, I've worked for large and small organisations and I, I'm with you, it's such a different challenge and you have to be much more aware of what's seen as a good thing in terms of proactive working and maybe stepping on someone else's <laughs> area it's like it's a hard it's a whole different game isn't it um yeah and I think you have to be good at you have to get good at sort of saying no to things as well because I think it's I'm sure this is the same with all kind of all kind of work roles but it's quite easy for somebody to sort of say you know oh Hayley I've seen this thing like we should do that you know like as though it's nothing yeah <laughs> and, yeah. and it's just like really enthusiastic about something if advice comes to you and says like why don't you do this it's like I've, I've had this idea and it's you know and yeah sometimes it's quite hard because you, you, you kind of think yeah great like that sounds brilliant but then you sort of look around and you think well when who's got you know and yeah so <laughs> sometimes it's managing the what you what you can realistically do um yeah, yeah definitely I, I mean I, I have a habit of agreeing to things on a happy Friday that then I have to pay <laughs> yeah. the price. I paid a price on Monday, Tuesday, and I'm like, damn, why did I say yes to that? You're <laughs> a different person then, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. All the inbox is full now. So it's not it's not as easy as uh, last week's Jason was not uh, was not helpful. Um I'd love to, to ask about how you deal with like there's a lot of uh work you do, especially now when you're local, you probably come across uh firsthand the impacts of um kind of gaps in government services and support you probably come across quite a lot of stories you know I even we we run charity campaigns and people mistake them as us being a charity so we get exposed to just a tiny percent of that because people think we're a charity and, and we're not so you must see so much of that how do you deal with like the stories that you come across for like providing support as a citizen's advice communicator Yeah, so I think um, I think what's been hard, particularly for us to live in, and I think more certainly more so for our advisors, we're kind of faced faced with people who are struggling every day, you know, um, and in those difficult situations. I think certainly our advisors have kind of said that 
there are some situations where actually there's nothing you can do like there are we have run out of tools to help this person you know we've we've, we've done the debt check we've checked the benefits we've done maximize their income as much as we can and actually still this person is still in a crisis and what do you do then you know and and of course these are these are people's lives and um there's a lot of emotion and I think our advisors obviously take that on and and we we sort of have increase in people who are in crisis as I say or where there's maybe safeguarding issues and things where an advisor might you know have to make a judgment call of is this person actually you know this person's perhaps made a reference to um to wanting to take their life or something like how do you make that call what do you do um so I think certainly internally we do a lot around how we just support each other in 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 dealing with those difficult situations so um our advisors for example have supervisors who are kind of on on call effectively they're obviously able to take time out after difficult calls um, we have um people in the service who are like trained as mental health first aiders and we also have um count like counseling service that's available to to everybody within the charity um and I think on kind of a comms level, um, so myself and my colleague who kind of have access to the social media side, which you do get a lot, particularly through the night, I would say, because that's when people can't contact anybody. Mm-hmm. So you, you, you often get those kind of messages that are, you think, I don't really know what to, someone's just offloaded, really. You know, you can sort of imagine yeah. someone can't sleep or whatever. Um, and I think, yeah, knowing what to do in that circumstance is really challenging um certainly within my team we kind of we're not both on social media every day so we kind of um both you know we do it on like a router kind of basis so one person can just not not look at anything <laughs> uh, and same with the news because it's quite important for us to be um having one eye on what's what's going on what might be coming up what's being said in the local news what's happening in the national news but um that's dra- you know draining because it's never good news <laughs> Um, yeah. And I think everyone finds that you can get you can get really kind of burnt out by it. So I think it's just um, yeah having having the space for people to take time out um, and just understanding the 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 yeah the, the challenges really of working for a charity. I think one thing that helps it certainly helps me is knowing that it is probably the um, the policy side of the work that we do and I, I hope that's kind of the same for our advisors as well that where there are situations where you think oh gosh you know that I've had a really awful day everybody I've seen has been in like this awful crisis you know I've not felt that I've been able to move that person forward or this is a problem that just keeps coming up again and again and you know it's it's, it's frustrating I think the kind of hope comes in the work that the charity does around actually um dealing with issues at the root so whether that is kind of influencing government whether it is kind of um yeah using the evidence that we've gathered to actually create change because I think without that it could feel a bit like just bad on bad you know yeah. <laughs> um, so I think we all kind of have to keep that hope of what um what we can do to actually kind of improve things in the future yeah that I mean that's it really does pay in like kind of pain into your weekends and evenings especially on the social media side as well that's so interesting that you guys like take a break from it because you have to because you're kind of operating behind a logo obviously and that logo does a lot obviously for protection but it also does a lot for making people forget that they're talking to someone real so you're kind of if you're trying to provide solutions to a what probably feels like a uh you know a really difficult situation and is a difficult situation sometimes people don't want it to be fixed necessarily or they don't see your solutions as being helpful and they can really be quite harsh back and forget that you know you're human and you've got a face and you're a person and you're not the kind of uniformed company so yes I mean it must be so difficult I think a lot of marketing and, and comms people experience that in terms of people commenting and just forgetting that that I was just doing the job and I tried to do yeah. the job as best I can and I'm actually trying to help and I'm being you know in our case we've, we've got TikTok ads and we get like some nasty comments on that 
um and you're like yeah. oh god man you don't have to come at me like that we we have the same thing where the same person whose ads have gone out if we're in front on video won't review the comments because they could be hard <laughs> yeah and it sounds yeah. like yeah. You, you have a similar process in place it's, it's it, it does stay with you when people say that say stuff like that doesn't it yeah definitely <laughs> Um, awesome. I, I think it'd be good to talk about, or do you, have you got a few more questions on advertising, Astra, or do you want to go into segment two? No, I just have one more question, uh, not relating to advertising, but in terms of um, what kind of resource you do have, like you said, sometimes you've run out of tools to help people. Is there, because um, I know across the charity sphere, there's lots of like, oh, we'll point you in a direction of perhaps another charity who can help you. Is that something that you guys do? So, you know, if someone's got negative income, will you sort of send them to a food bank and that sort of thing yeah so we have um so we work and I think we have to do this because of the, the demand on the service but we can't be kind of experts in everything so it's about tapping into other organizations and we work with um we have partners across our four boroughs that we work within and, and local citizens advice I'm sure are similar across the country so you'll work with organizations in your area um, but I suppose in having those partnerships, we're able to kind of refer directly rather than say, oh, here's a number, call it. So yeah. you'll find if someone's come to you, you need to do something there and then they won't necessarily have the courage to ring another person. Or um, So we're able to kind of do these internal um, referrals without sort of losing that person. And particularly at the moment where people's problems are more complicated than they perhaps have been in the past so you might you might have somebody who comes in and says um I can't pay my energy bill but you'll do a bit of digging and that's not the only problem you know that mm. they can't pay their energy bill because I don't know they've lost their job or something's happened and there's often kind of four or five different issues within that problem yeah um it may be that they need like a debt assessment which is something that our debt team could do but for example if somebody needs specialist um housing like legal advice or employment advice that's not something that we can offer locally because we're not funded to to do the kind of in-depth like employment law stuff or mm -hmm. housing law um but we can refer through to other local citizens advice offices who do have that funding or to other local charities um yeah so it's it's a really good way of us kind of um for, for all of the people involved really to kind of make sure that we're supporting somebody in in one place so their kind of customer journey to make it sound really, really, really you, know, <laughs> um, you know is is just there they just they're coming to citizens advice and we're helping them you know they're not then going out to sort of six or seven other places oh that makes that makes sense I know that the um that's actually why I need to speak to citizens advice and I know that the inner city Manchester one is housing related and employment funded also yes so if anyone listening needs that yes. text, there you go <laughs> are you gonna talk about your personal needs for yeah i'll tell you all advice? about my landlord if you want <laughs> oh, wait, yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe okay. after <laughs> okay uh let's move into section two so um yeah. as always we're going to do a very short quiz called fake facts um in which we're going to cover three statements of which uh two of them are true and one of them is false uh, i'm going to read them out so that if you're listening you can play along too uh, and i'm going to be hosting today with astra um and hayley yeah. competing um i think with these this tends to be uh, uh, uh we've kept it relevant obviously to the conversation but um, please don't feel like this is a test of all your knowledge on citizens' advice because there's so much <laughs> to know. Um, but it's just more. I'm lose my job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, more of an opportunity to share some more, uh, raise people's awareness about the work that you guys do. So let's go into it. Um, so the first one, citizens' advice was made up of over seven thousand seven hundred advisors and eighteen thousand eight hundred volunteers in 2020, 2021. Oh, uh, is it second one is during 2020 and 2021 uh, citizens advice's pay, advice pages were viewed 10 million times uh, or is it the first statement that in 2020 2021 citizens ad advice helped 58,000 people face to face Ooh, I don't I feel like the bottom one because 2020 and 2021 was a COVID year is fake 
Oh yeah. I think. Good shout. <laughs> Good shout. Helia, you're nodding. Are you in agreement there? Definitely, that feels very low. Yeah, because I I know that and like I think we I think just my small one of those local offices helped about forty five thousand that year. So surely, surely it's higher than yeah. that. Yeah, maybe you were the only one working throughout the year. Everyone else is fair late. <laughs> 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 So let's see. So you both go for number three. I think so. Yeah. Oh no! Oh, apparently, number two. Uh, there was actually sixty million, uh, sixty million worth of traffic. Oh, during a year on the Citizens Advice pages. That website is getting Blind, bloody hell. <laughs> users. <laughs> it's getting so seen by so many people. Wow. I guess that was also a COVID year, though. So everybody was at home, sort of probably like you say googling furlough and what happens now and yeah was it yeah it was, was well you had kind of had to, was it was it the it depends March where the 2020 is. was the start that was the first of the first lockdown oh god i can't remember wow and 2021 it depends when it i guess how late it goes into it yeah no i think the 60 million because i know that I, I know that during that year, when COVID started, we sort of started to be listed on a lot of the government kind of guidance as a right. as a place to go. Yeah. I think a big spike from that as well that we were kind of just listed on a lot of things, whereas you know, so I think that would account for a bump. Ah, that must, yeah, that must do wonders for traffic. I mean, you must get a lot of. I don't suppose you know if you get a lot of requests for people to get their links on your website because you must have a high. You you're essentially up there with like the government websites and universities as a really good source of a, a link that would help people with natural Google rankings. Do you get loads of requests like that? I think we do, but we do have like the national charity has a. Um, I think they're called like the expert advice team. So uh, they're because obviously things change because there's so much content on the national website. You know, you can go into housing, and then within that, there's so much, and things change constantly. So th there are people at the national charity who are kind of constantly updating, making sure that the, you know has there been any changes in advice, um, a, a link still active, a kind of date still right. I think. So most of the local citizens advice services will have their own their own website. Like we have our own website, um, which is more of a landing page because when it comes to advice, we're signposting out to the national. You know, we're not duplicating all of the content and, and looking yeah. at it constantly. Um, but yeah, that, yeah. Makes sense. that makes sense. Yeah, that's that's. I mean, that's those are insane numbers as well in terms of traffic. So you, you there's some heavy work to be done on the domain and server side um yeah right let's go into the second one then so um 700 000 people contacted citizens advice for advice on benefits in 2020 to 2021 uh every year since citizens advice saves the government and public services 20 million or the third one, Citizens Advice estimates their total social and economic value to society to be £4.3 billion. Pounds. I'll let you take that one, Hayley. Um, I can imagine that the bottom one would be true. Um, again, gosh, I'm not, not good with the numbers. I feel like the top one for me, I feel like that could be higher. If we help, if my figures were right and we'd helped about two and a half million, benefits is like such a big part, a big chunk of the advice that we give because mm. it fits so many things within it. Mm. But then also the middle one, that feels low. I'm going to go middle one, okay. but with very little confidence. <laughs> I'm going to go for the bottom one because... Only to be a to be different from you, Haley, and b <laughs> because billion seems really high, and it's a number that I can't get my head around. So I don't, I'm not convinced yeah. it's even a real number. So I'm going to say that one. <laughs> um, let's have a look. I say so you are uh, you are right, Haley. Um, yeah. Every year, Citizens Advice actually saves six hundred and eighteen million. Uh, it's for quite addition. Public services. Wow. Me. So much more. Um, yeah. Huge amount. Oh no! You, sorry, I said you were right, Haley. Hey, you got you said the first one, didn't you? So is it is it still one one? Did I? I said no. Haley said middle one. 
No, it's the middle one. Right, cool. Yeah. So it's two. Just willing to accept that I was right regardless. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Haley, Haley's ahead now, going into our final round. So these facts are focused around help through hardship helpline. Okay. Um, all right, so in 2020, 2021, the Help Through Hardship Helpline answered over 49,000 calls. Um, in the same year, the Help Through Hardship Helpline helped to feed 60,000 people. And in the same year, the same helpline secured 1 million in expected financial gains for clients. Ooh, I feel like 49,000 is quite low. I do, and I feel, but I also feel like one million in expected financial gains feels quite low, but it just depends how many people. So the help through hardship um, helpline is kind of um, something that's managed like through the national charity. So it's not something that I really know about at a local level. Um, I'm going to say... Um, I'm going to say the bottom one, maybe. Which one is it, Jason? What did you say, Astra? I think the top one. Top one. And that means that Haley's the winner. Um, wins. It's, it's actually 8.5 million um, that the Help Through Hardship helpline has secured in expected financial gains for clients in 2020 and 2021. Um, and the other bad. two are true. I just so, want to hear you say help through hardship helpline again. <laughs> really, so <laughs> five times. <laughs> and for some reason, 2020, 2021 is really yeah. hard to say. <laughs> just three twenties in the video, middle of that. Um, right, I'll hand over to you, Astra, for the random recap third segment. Yeah, so um, in this final section, we pull up a random word generator, which I'm just doing now. And with whatever word it generates, we will try and sort of recap some of the key themes from today. It doesn't have to be um, serious. It can be very serious, but we'll use whatever comes up. So, oh, the word is currency. If anyone wants to take a dig first. Currency. I feel, well, I feel like we've talked obviously a lot about currency in the sense that, um, Hayley, your marketing budget is quite low and there's lots of people to reach. So you have to be quite experimental with how far you can stretch that pound, so to speak. Um, but also in terms of, you know, people have less and less money. And that's part of the reason that's putting the pressure on your services in the first place. So that's my recap. I don't want to go too far uh, into that because I might steal all the ideas. Can I... <laughs> Can I, can I go next on, on currency? So obviously currencies are... We metric. can't leave the guest last, Jason. Oh, okay. <laughs> go on, go on, Hayley. <laughs> no, no, go. no, go on, honestly. Go please. on. Um, so uh, it is harder to go last, to be honest, because then it's like everyone's done all of the things. So yeah, currency... Um, just I just thought... really weird what you said. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so currency is a metric, and I think... It might seem easier to kind of measure how effective a company is because they have a uh, profit and revenue and and you just got to make money, pay salaries and grow. That's the kind of metrics and currency there. With this, it's a little bit more obscure and you've kind of touched on that a few a few a few ways because as well as the funding um, for for citizens' advice, your currency and your success is measured in how well you can help people, which is such a difficult thing to yeah. measure um and you talked there about how queries influence uh kind of how the operations of the business stack up and that's so interesting because that's a currency in itself or a metric in itself that no other business i've worked in or seen or, or spoken about has to consider so yeah currency has been a bit of a subject here that's been quite relevant yeah and i think as well like i know um some some not all outcomes can be kind of measured as the as a number or a cost like of money saved so i think there are also things that we would measure around um how people feel for example at the end of a phone call you know like um so what kind of impact might it have had on somebody's mood or on somebody's mental health so we may not for example um have been able to 
give them the outcome they thought they wanted, you know, or that they'd kind of contacted us about, but they might have um, got something off their mind and they might have like a next step. They might have like something, you know, somewhere they can go with a problem that previously was just kind of all encompassing. Um, I also feel like, and I don't know if I've got the meaning of the word currency wrong, it's highly, highly likely, but I guess currency can also be like, kind of tools that you have as a charity so I'm thinking in terms of um you know where we don't necessarily have um money to like deliver certain services we do have that the kind of network around us that we can utilize it's kind of a very much a two-way and like a back and forth thing so um we're kind of making the most of the resources that we have available around us rather than expecting we can do everything or that we can be an expert absolutely everything um but yeah I certainly think when it comes to um money you know I mean there's a lot that I feel particularly around social media and kind of advertising so we have had in the past we've been able to get bits of funding for paid advertising like for Facebook ads and things and we do have like the the um the Google Ads grant, you know, as a charity, which is is brilliant. Um, but I think there's a lot to be said for um, the kind of organic side of social media and trying to build those meaningful relationships, even though the figures don't look so great, you know, and there's this, in the back of your mind, you're sort of thinking, oh, I want to increase this, I want to increase that, I want more people to see this and reach more people. But I think certainly with the the kind of, the, the content that, that we're just putting out and the kind of things that we're creating with no budget it, it's easier in some ways to then measure what's working and what isn't things can get a bit skewed I feel when we've kind of dipped into paid advertising because you think oh that's gone really well but then you think well of course it has because we've like you know I've managed yeah. to get it out to like 500,000 people in Oldham or um so I think it can kind of skew your um you know why we're doing what we're doing because it's not just about reaching loads of people it's about reaching the right people isn't it with the different whatever the message is whatever the thing you're trying to share um so yeah I think in some ways I quite value the the thinking about actually not thinking about the money side of it as much because it's off mm. the table for most yeah. reasons, you know what can we do with the, people, with the things that we create here and now um you know, and, and focus more on the kind of meaningful connections that we can make rather than the biggest or the best, you know, reach of stuff. That's such a good point. There's, mm. yeah. there's a lot of, um, I, I've seen, there's a guy called Mike Winnett on on LinkedIn and, I, and he also o- often talks about this when it comes to people putting social media out and, and and there's like ways that you can gain the system. So you can get obviously your friends and family and your mum to like and comment and stuff. And his point is why do that? Because you're never going to learn whether it actually connects with the people you want it to connect with. Because you're just getting your your pods in this case or your friends, your community to post on it. Yeah, more people will see it, but not the people you want, just more of your mates. So <laughs> it's so whereas yeah, if, you exactly, just don't, yeah. if you don't do that and if you don't spend money on the post promoting it, and it still gets really good engagement right that's you learning something to make your next post even better but you'll never learn if you spend straight away and if you get other people to post on it so that's a really yeah. good point you probably are working out exact on the on the ground you're working out what actually vibes with the people that you want to you want to engage so yeah i agree with that yeah and i'd certainly for us like without a doubt the kind of things that do get the most engagement um it, it's the our advisors so when they're sharing stuff photos of our advisors like people want to see who would be helping them um and also stories so it's being able to I think often it's hard if you're if you've got a specific problem you might think they won't be able to help me with that or I wouldn't really know how to explain this issue but if we can share a story around you know I don't know whoever that came to us with this problem we did kind of x y and z they said that they felt you know on top of the world or whatever you know that you can kind of make it real and someone can then relate to that and think okay maybe I'll pick up the phone like you know they helped her they might be able to me so I think we, we kind of know that the types of content that people want to see um and where we get the most engagement so 
Um, yeah, and, and I don't think we would have got that if we had just put money where, you know, on messages that we thought were the most important or that we kind of wanted to get out the most. Yeah, definitely. That's a really good point. I've never really thought about that to that point because uh, obviously we advocate for paid advertising all the time, but there is that other side to it um, as a marketing yeah. agency. We, we have to be aware of that. Cool. Um, Astra, is there anything else that you wanted to, to cover off? No, I don't think so. Hayley, you've been in- incredible, giving lots of insight into many different facets. So thank you so much. Yeah, I'd, I'd just like oh, to thank ask, you for having me. ask one more question, which is about um, whether there's anyone in the space, in the community or outside, that you would like yeah. to shed some light on. Um, anyone that's doing really great work um, in, in the in the charity space um, that maybe we could speak to next or we can share with our followers in terms of their work. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, or there's lots of people that are kind of just in my personal network that I, um, you know, so certainly within Citizens Advice, there's um, people doing similar roles to me around the country. So it's great to be able to kind of tap in with them, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and check in with them and see what's working for them, what are they doing, is there other resources we can share, what's working, that kind of thing. So I think I always want to just shout out anyone that's doing um has a really broad role and is just kind of one person um trying to kind of achieve loads so there's certainly like for example like Manchester Citizens Advice, Sheffield Citizens Advice um where they've got they've built kind of a really good way of um doing comms and reaching people and and keeping it interesting and not being really fixed to kind of these are the things we do but Mm -hmm. being kind of flexible and I think more broadly like for me again working in a small charity where I've not really come from um so my background is working in like careers advice for university so I've not kind of got any relevant experience she says (laughs) but you know I've kind of into it and learned as I've gone so I've had to kind of tap into training and and, um done like mentoring and that kind of thing so I would say that charity comms um has been like amazing for me throughout my my kind of career in terms of being able to attend different networking events um getting experience with mentoring um being able to kind of go to like a 30 minute session on this really specific area of comms that you know um fits into your day and you it's not taking you away you're not sort of having to do like a three-week course on something but you can kind of dip in and, and out of it and I think that sort of thing is really good when you I think in some ways you can't it can be a little bit of a lonely role if you're on if you feel that you're sort of on your own and like no one in the organization understands me you know? no one kind of <laughs> but you know you can sort of feel a little bit like who do I go to for help if I'm the comms person and I'm not part of like a a team you know and maybe your managers not comms and nothing to do with comms they're kind of a you know they've got a, a bigger remit across the organization so I think just being able to um connect with other people in similar roles and tap into skills and um training from like bigger organizations has been has been really good for me awesome well, yeah, thank you Thank you so much for sharing. Um, I've learned a lot about Citizens Advice, about your role, yeah. um, and just about in, in general how the whole thing kind of comes together. And the history of it was really interesting as well. I didn't know you guys started uh, just after the Second World War. Mm, um, yeah. So, yeah, thank you very much for joining us on the Fame Landing page. Thank you. It's been lovely. I'll speak to you soon.